Let's look a little bit at the left hand dagger sword breaker. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. Now first up, this dagger has been kindly lent to me by Todd of Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler and has been used on his channel, in fact for a couple of collaborations that we have done together. Now, he has talked about these daggers before and other people out there have talked about these daggers before. I'm just going to give my impressions of these. I'm not going to do a hugely in-depth video um, and in fact the big video really will be on Todd's channel. So check out the link below to Todd's channel uh, where you can see a lot more information and testing with the sword breakers. Now, my views on them, I have never regarded these as sword breakers although I don't think it's impossible that they could break blades. Now I'll talk about that in a little bit, but first up, just to set the context for these, these are a type of dagger that is used in the left hand, at least in theory, together with a rapier in the right hand. That's, uh, so essentially they are 17th century gimmick left hand daggers. Now what's a left hand dagger, often called a man gauche, which just means left hand, um, but uh, what is a left hand dagger? Well quite simply, when you're fencing with a rapier, it becomes eminently useful to have something in your left hand. If we look at rapier treatises, we sometimes see bucklers used, sometimes forms of larger shield, uh, but of course you can't carry them around with you every day. So even things like cloak and lantern and various other things carried in the left hand. Now these, as far as I'm aware, are not shown in any fencing treatises, but there are some surviving. Now the first thing I want to say is I am an antique arms and armor dealer and I have known for many years that a lot of the sword breakers floating around in the arms and armor world are sadly not genuine. They are uh, fakes, probably 19th century fakes for the most part. And there have even been some people who questioned whether these were used at all. Well, I don't think there's any question that some of them are genuine. And they really captured the imagination of 19th century antiquarians and people uh, collecting arms and armour, making um, great displays in their stately homes, and ultimately um, creating the foundations for a lot of the museums, like the Wallace Collection, the Royal Armouries, the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Louvre, that exist today. So uh, the fact is that these have perhaps disproportionately ended up in the arms and armour world. Because they look freaking awesome, they probably weren't ever really used much in reality. We certainly don't have much evidence that they were used much in reality, but they certainly existed. So a very rare thing that captured people's imagination, a bit like the scissors katars that we find in uh, India, which were probably made in the 17th, 18th century as real things occasionally. And then the 19th century British came along and went, that's awesome, I want one of those. And so they started making essentially replicas for the tourist market. And I suspect that's what happened with these things as well. Now, why would you use one? And why wouldn't you use one? Uh, the second part of the question is actually kind of more difficult to answer. So the first thing is, why would you use one? Well, I think there's no question that with this designer blade, you can trap the opponent's sword. Now, rapiers, before we go into talking about the dagger a little bit more, we just have to diverge for a second and say that rapiers in this period are incredibly diverse, okay? Rapier, as we've discussed in numerous videos and many other people out on YouTube have discussed as well and various other people writing books have discussed, rapier is a very vague term that doesn't exactly tell us what a sword is. The fact is that you can have something that many people would describe as a rapier, which has a blade almost like a broadsword or a, um, uh, you know, a, a backsword or not so much a backsword, but a double-edged sword with a, a, a sort of warlike, should we call it, blade on it. So a, a slightly broader, heavier, longer, bigger, whatever blade. And at the other end of the spectrum, in the same period, you can get some rapiers which are moving in the direction of what later became small swords. They are very narrow, much lighter, um, and uh, they're therefore not as effective for the most part in cutting. So there've been many debates about can a rapier cut? Well, what's a rapier? It's like saying, it's like saying can a three, two, four, one cut? What's a three, two, four, one? Um, so the problem is until you agree what a rapier is, which we can never do because it's a vague term, you can't have these discussions very easily and you have to qualify everything and add lots of caveats in. So the question is, let's talk about swords instead of rapiers. Can a sword get trapped in these daggers? Yes, 
Absolutely. If we take a relatively narrow blade, it doesn't have to be what we'd standardly call these days uh, by standard a uh, uh, rapier. It could be something more like a side sword. It could even be something like a back sword or a broad sword, um, or even some types of um, sabre um, and dusak that were around at this time as well. Can a thin flat blade pass between these things and get trapped? Yes, absolutely. Are you likely to be able to break it using just the leverage of your left hand? No. Is it impossible? Not necessarily. Why do I say that? Well, the simple fact is that uh, modern metallurgy is a lot better than uh, 17th century metallurgy. So the fact is that when these were being used in the 16th, 17th century, the blades weren't as consistent as modern steel is. They didn't use modern alloy steels, didn't use modern tool steels, they didn't use modern spring steels. They used period um, fabricated steels, which were more prone to failure than modern steels are. And that's just the steel. The heat treatment was also less scientific than it is in the modern world. So the simple fact is that using one of these, if you trap someone's blade in it, and we have completely demonstrated that yes, you can trap blades in here, whichever way round it is held, you can find a way to trap a blade in it if you're lucky. Then indeed, uh, if the other person's unlucky, if they have a particularly narrow blade, if you catch it near the tip, um, if it's got some flaw in the heat treatment or the, the steel, then yes, it might break. Okay, the simple fact is that swords did break and they still do break, even with modern steel, even with modern heat treatment, swords do sometimes break. So technically, yes, this could be a sword breaker. Okay, but I don't think that that's what its primary purpose was. And as we've discussed, as I've discussed with Todd, the fact is that if you trap an opponent's blade in here, as the dagger person, as the person who's done the trapping, you don't necessarily want the other person's blade to break. Why? Well, the simple fact is that within a duel, within a sword fight, one of the best things you can do is incapacitate and occupy and detain and possibly even disarm the opponent's sword. If you found a way of capturing the opponent's sword, which prevents them from using it against you, why would you want to give that up? If a blade breaks here, it's not going to be detained anymore. It's going to be free. So the simple fact is that, yes, I think these could break blades, but no, I absolutely do not think that they were intended to break blades because the simple fact is that breaking an opponent's blade is far, far, far less useful than trapping it and holding it. So I think this is an advanced gripping device. Okay. Now, the, the second and probably final thing I want to say about these daggers is that we don't really know how they might have been used. There's no, they're not in any treatises and we don't know which way round to hold them. Okay, now you'll notice that this only has a side ring on one side and depending who you talk to, the general, uh, generally um, accepted knowledge is that when you're fencing rapier and dagger, your thumb goes on the flat of the blade and in, su su in fact, some left-hand daggers have a special thumb placer on the, what we call the inside flat of the blade. And they're actually held square on like this. They're not held with an edge forward usually. They're usually held with the cross guard out sideways at some kind of angle. And that ring provides some degree of protection to the back of the hand to things which collide with the flat of the blade and slide down. So it won't hit you straight on the hand. Very similar to a nagel or nail on a langmesser, or indeed a shell guard on a dusak or these kind of things. Okay, so this side ring, very good at uh, providing for a minimal amount of metal and protrusion an inconvenience, uh, a reasonable amount of protection to the side of the hand. So generally speaking, they'd be held like this. That is therefore that the catching would be on the inside. So you might be parrying and defending like with a normal dagger on the outside line, but trying to catch on the inside line relative to the dagger. That being said, you could physically flip it around the other way and put your thumb up inside the ring. You'd now lose that protection to the top of your knuckle there you'd run the potential risk that your thumb gets hurt or stuck inside that side ring. And we have found that when the teeth are pointing outwards that way, they become harder, more difficult to trap the opponent's blade. But that you might have some specific technique in mind for where for some reason you want to flip the thing around. Who knows, maybe that's a thing. Uh, I can't personally think of one, but I'm not primarily a rapier fencer. So, that is pretty much my final thought on these daggers, is they are absolutely, yes, they did exist. 
Yes, they were widely faked and copied in the 19th century and 20th century. I think they're predominantly held that way around. I think they're predominantly for grabbing and detaining a blade on the inside line. Yes, they can break a blade, but I don't think that's pr their primary purpose. So, as concisely as Matt Easton can be, that is my overview of um, sword breaker daggers or left hand daggers with detaining teeth in. These are for trapping, for grabbing, and they do work when they work, they work incredibly well. So don't purely put these down as a gimmick. I think they worked very, very well. Why do, final parting thought, why do I not think that they were more popular? Well, they're incredibly difficult to make, costly to make, and prone to breakage. This is all kinds of stress risers all the way along here. Um, so in any kind of rough combat, there's a very large chance that these will get broken. Also, you've got the issues of a scabbard and how to wear it. Um, and uh, perhaps in some places there were even legal issues about wearing something like this, I don't know. But I think overall it's not the most practical weapon in the world, but don't paint it purely as a gimmick, because when you trap a blade in here, it really does work very, very well. And there were lots of other less usual and more unusual things in this period, um, such as a glove with a mailed um, palm and fingers, so you could actually just grab an opponent's blade. Actually, that's one of the best things around in this period, is wearing male-lined gloves, so you can just grab the opponent's sword and then shank them to death with your own sword. Um, so there were many funky and many types of bucklers with trapping bars and stuff like this, and many types of left-hand daggers with trapping quillons. Um, so there were lots and lots of gimmicks at this time to try and, try and control the rapier fight uh, in terms of gaining a larger success rate in, frankly, what can often be a very, very dangerous, dangerous fight between two people with rapier and daggers, where I'd imagine, statistically, there were a lot of duels where both people ended up dead or very badly injured. Um, so I think they were scrambling around looking for any kind of thing that they could possibly think of that might work to increase your success rate. I hope this has been interesting. Give us a like and a subscribe, and I'll see you back on the channel again soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.